Okay, today's daf we're going to be learning is Beitza daf kaf, be, uh, kaf gimel. Today's daf is sponsored anonymously in memory of Batsheva Esther Bat Yosef Shalom Rebetz and Batsheva Kanievsky. Okay, we're going to start at the bottom. We were in the middle of this topic. Okay, let's just go remember where we were because also you'll see how all the upcoming Mishnah will connect as well. We're going to finish the third chapter today and start as uh, the second chapter and start the third. Um, so we saw that Rabban Gamliel was stringent in three ways, more so than the rabbis. And then we saw that he was lenient, sorry, strict as in Beit Shammai, Beit Shammai versus Beit Hillel. He took Beit Shammai's position in three areas. Then we saw that he was lenient in three ways against the rabbis. And then we're going to get to Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah, who is lenient against the rabbis on three other issues, some related to Yantif, one of them not related to Yantif. And from there, we're going to get off on some other tangents into connected with things that he had mentioned. So we were up to this question about Ishun Peirot, about smoking fruits. Yesterday, we went into Teal, we passed some area and and right as we passed by, my husband said, I think they were just smoking fruits over there. And I said, oh, that's really too bad. I didn't get a picture of it. That would have been great. But it was too late at that point. But anyway, the whole idea of smoking fruits is that we're doing something to food. So it's a food-related issue. However, it doesn't really improve the taste of the fruits. Or maybe it does, right? We're going to have to see. So the first thing we saw is Ibailahu, a question was asked, Ma'ulashen, can one smoke fruits? To which we saw at the bottom of the daf that, Rav says it's forbidden, Shmuel says it's permitted, and then Rav Huna tries to explain why did Rav forbid it. And then he said the reason is because it's mechabe. When you put those aro- aro- or aromatic spices on the coals, which is how they prepared it, it would put out the coals, right? When you put something hot into something, put something cold on something hot, it'll start putting it out or something that's you know not necessarily hot. So then Rav Nachman says, but also it's mavir because it burns the spices to which he said, well, it does both. But I was kind of mentioning the first thing that happens, the immediate first thing that happens is first, it cools down the, spi- the coals and then, right, which is part of extinguishing, then it's mavir. Now we're going to have another thing. So Rav Yehuda comes along and he says another machloket about this issue. And he says, if you put it on coals, as we just described, it will be forbidden, as Rav said. But but if you put it in an earthenware vessel that you heat it up, which was another way to do it, where there aren't coals inside, then it's going to be permitted because you're not causing anything to extinguish. The Rava Amal, Rava, sorry, Rava says, he disagrees with the Rav Yehuda and says, no, no, what do you mean? Also, in one of these earthenware vessels that are hot, it's still going to be forbidden because even though you're not extinguishing anything, you're basically creating something new. This goes back to the beginning of the chapter, the Mesechet, when we talked about nolad and kind of creating something, right? Something in egg was something that wasn't in existence before Yantif. So here also, it seems to be a similar thing. It's a little bit different. There we're talking about, right, is it muktzah? Here it's not so much as it mukta, but it's that you're creating something new that didn't exist. You're creating an aroma that didn't exist before you put it into this vessel. And therefore, that in and of itself is a problem. So Rashi points out, by the way, right, what's the malacha? So he says it's not really a malacha. He says it's It's very interesting language. It's like doing some, you know, like, because what, what are malachot? It actually makes sense that one would say this is forbidden because malachot, we talked all throughout Masachat Shabbat, it's about cre- being creative, creating something new, right? The way God created the world. So by us creating something new, it's not exactly malacha, but it, it seems like a malacha. And therefore he says it's a rabbinic prohibition. So we now have, again, let's just go back to where we started. First, it seemed like they were talking about smoking fruit on coals. And to that, we saw there's a debate. Is it permitted? Is it forbidden? Within the opinion that it's forbidden, which was rough, we now are having kind of variations. Is it forbidden in every case or is it forbidden just when there's coals? When there aren't coals, is it going to be permitted or not? And there there's a machloket about whether it's a problem just to create a new aroma or not. Rabbi of Rav Yosef, so now the same Rabbi who just said it's Moli Recha here and it's a problem, he's going to have a problem with Moli Recha in a different situation. 
And he and Rabbi Yosef both say, If you take a cup full of spices and you put it on top of clothing, okay, in those days, right, they didn't have washing machines. So to make the clothes smell better, they would put aromatic spices on top. So he took a cup with spices in it and he put it over uh, silk garments. That's forbidden to do a Yom Tov because again, what are you doing? My time, I'm Mishum to Kamolid Recha. You're creating a smell in these clothes that didn't exist before, right? The smell of the spices existed, but now what you're doing is you're making the clothes smell better. That's a problem. Umayshna, now the Gemara asks, but why is this any different? Me molilo umayriachbo. Remember Milila, when you would take the grains and you would crush them up, crumble them in your fingers? So here we're talking not about grains, but we're saying take twigs with you know spices on them, crumble them. If you crumble them up in your hands, what happens when you do that, right? We all know it, it brings out the smell better. So why is that, or kotmo meiriachbo, if you cut off the top of a, of a twig, you know, that comes from spices, it also brings out the flavor. So why is that not a problem of moli recha? Those seem to be permitted on yantif. So why is that any different? So they answer, hatam recha mia ita, but osufe hu de kamosif recha. Ha ha olude hu de kamolid recha. There's a difference between creating a spice from nothing or taking something and enhancing the smell that already existed. So you had this nice smell of the, of the spices, but by crumbling up in your fingers or cutting off the top of it, you now enhance the aroma. That's something totally different. That's going to be permitted. That sounds a lot like, if you remember from Masecha Shabbat, Mosif Ohel. Remember we talked about a, a stroller, a baby stroller, let's say a baby carriage where you have a, a, a the, you know, the, the part that opens up, right? Or an awning, something like that. So this, the sunshade. So you're allowed to open that, the hood, I guess, thank you. You're allowed to open that on Yantif, on Shabbos. Why are you allowed to open it on Shabbos? Because it's already a tefach thick of open. So you're just adding to something that's already in existence. That we're always going to be much more lenient about than actually building something that didn't exist before. Like to put a tarp over from scratch, that would be a problem. Okay, so... Now, what, that was just a tangent from this issue of Moli Recha. But now if we go back to the beginning, or almost the beginning, and as again, we started off with a machlok at Rav and Shmuel about putting it on coals. Then we moved on to this debate about what about in an earthenware vessel where there aren't coals? Is that a problem of Moli Recha or not? And we saw two opinions. Now we're going to see a third opinion. Rava Amar, nami mutar, right? According to Rava and Rav Yehuda, both agreed that on coals, it's going to be forbidden. But he goes back to Shmuel's opinion, who permitted it on coals. And now he's going to say, why? Because this is no different than cooking meat on coals. When you put meat on the coals, it also causes keyboard extinguishing. But we don't care because it's ochal nefesh, smoking fruits. He also views as part of ochal nefesh. This is enhancing food. It's true that you could eat it without and it's cooked without it and it's not cooking it, but it is enhancing the fruit and therefore, and the experience you had eating the fruit when it has this aroma and therefore it's, it's basically permitted. Now we're going to have a story about this, someone who paskined about this. Darish Rav Gavia Mibay Katil, that was where he was from. His name was Rav Gavia. He said the following, in the entrance to the house of the Reish Kaluta, which is probably like a public space. He got up there and he said, Kitura Shari. Kitura is permitted. So we don't yet know what Kitura is. It sounds like Lahaktir, Ktore, incense, smoke. Okay, so we're on the topic of smoking. So now, Amale Amemar, Amemar said to him, My Kitura, what is this Kitura? I Kitura Beide Mase Umanhu. If it's, okay, what's this bay day? So Rashi explains, if you mean to smoke, where else do you have, you know, smoke or, or um, we really call it smoke, but you would call it steam. Steaming, like steaming clothing to, to iron them. Okay, he says, if you're talking about that, that's a maseuman. That's like a specialty kind of thing. Only certain people know how to do that properly. And that, if you're talking about to do it on clothing, to steam clothing, for sure, that's going to be a problem on Yantif. First of all, why does he say Masse Uman? What does that have to do with Yantif? It doesn't really have to do with Yantif. It has to do, okay, we're in Cholamoid now. So it has to do with Cholamoid. And Cholamoid, 
you're sort you're not really allowed to do work. However, certain work is permitted, certain things are permitted, but not masse uman specialty, right? Ways of doing something like a seamstress. It's not supposed to work to do right specialty items. So therefore, um ikatur biyade, that's masse uman for sure that's forbidden on yant, right? It would be forbidden even on chalamoid. Ila ashen asur to come alurecha. And if you mean smoking like smoking fruits, we already know that that's forbidden because of molid recha, because it creates this aroma that didn't exist before. So Amar Rav Ashi, oh, sorry, I skipped because this appears twice. Il ashen asur de I'm on the first version. I, I went down by accident a few lines. So if it's to smoke, it's forbidden because you're extinguishing the, the coals. So Amar Rav Ashi, la olam la ashen midi de habra bisr de gomre. So Rav Ashi comes and says, no, it is to smoke fruits. And he obviously held like Rava, who said that it's permitted to do it, just like you're permitted to put meat on coals. You can put this fruit on coals and smoke them, right? You can put the spices on the coals to create this aroma to then smoke the fruits without a problem. That's the first version. The second version has minor differences. I already gave away one of them by reading the wrong version before. But Ika de Amre, Amar Amemar, Mikey Tura. So some people say after Rav Gavia taught this in the in front of Rav, um, the Resh Galuta's house, the Exilarch's house. Abemar said, what is this ketura? Ikitur biyade masse uman hu, right? If you're going to say it's the clothing, well, that's clearly masse uman to iron the clothing. Ila ashen asur de kamoli recha. And here the difference is in the first version, he said it's forbidden because of it's extinguishing the coals, as Rabbi Yehuda said. In the second version, he said, like Rabbah, that it's forbidden because you're creating a new aroma. Amar Rav Ashi, here Rav Ashi is a little different, although it's not really so significant. I said it in front of him. And in the name of someone very important, meaning Rav Ashi in the first case just kind of said it on his own. Here Rav Ashi is saying, I'm quoting someone else who said, um, which is, right? And I'm saying it in the name of this important person who said that it's just like cooking meat on coals and therefore it's not a problem. So that's the end of this topic of smoking, right? That we got to because we were talking about the minichimata mugmar biyomto, right? That was one of the things that he permitted to create a smell, which again, we explained yesterday based on Rav Asi, the second reading of Rav Asi, that what he was talking about was to make a smell in the room and not to put a smell into clothing. Vosim gedima kulas. The third thing that came up in that Mishnah was the gedima kulas, which is again, taking an animal the, the um, baby goat that they would slaughter on Pesach and cutting off the, the insides, putting them right either on the top, tying them on the top like a helmet or tying them on the sides. And that's the way they would roast the Korban Pesach. And therefore, even in the time when there was no Beit HaMikdash, Rabban Gamliel continued to do it the way roast his meat that night, the way they did it then. And then we said the rabbis disagreed and we're going to see this inside um, Tanya. There's a bright that says, Rabbi Yossi Omer, Todus Ish Romi, and we saw this in Psachim, Hinhig et Bnei Romi. He was a guy from Rome. He taught the, the Jews in Rome, Le'echol G'dim Kulas Belele Psachim, to eat their meat in that way on Pesach night after the destruction of the temple. Shachule, they said to him, listen, we don't like what you're doing, Todus. The way they said it is in the following manner. If you were in Todus, the haha, the you know, wise, very brilliant person, important person, maybe. If you were in Todus, Gozrani Alecha Nidoi, we would excommunicate you for this. Okay, why do we see this is so severe? Shatam Achil et Bnei Israel Kodashim Bachutz, because you're feeding the Jewish people sacrificial meat outside of the city of Jerusalem. Remember, the sacrificial meat always had to be eaten inside Jerusalem. So they say. Kodashim Wait, what is this Brighta talking about? He didn't feed anybody sanctified meat outside of Jerusalem. It wasn't sanctified meat. It wasn't sacrificed. What he means is it's like Kodashim. In other words, people will think, people will see this and they'll think that you're eating Kodashim, sacrificial meat, and they'll see that you're eating it outside Jerusalem. And they'll think that once there's no longer a temple, one can sacrifice animals, and eat the meat outside Jerusalem, and that's not in fact true. So we don't want to mislead people. Before we move on, I want to just talk about a few interesting things. First of all, what's this line? 
if you were not told us, we would excommunicate you. First of all, we see that they excommunicated Rabbi Lezer Red Horkinus, who was a great Talmud Chacham, and yet they excommunicated. So what does it mean? Because you're so important, you would think all the more so, right? People always say, if you get put in Kherim, that means you're important, right? If you don't get put in Kherim, nobody pays attention to you, right? But getting put in Kherim means, oh, you actually mean something, right? Like no press is bad press, right? So what's this idea that because you're so important, we're not going to excommunicate you? It's a little bit of a strange thing. So first of all, it could mean, listen, we don't agree with you, but we agree to disagree, right? We want to tell you that we really don't like what you're doing. We assume you must have a good reason for doing what you did because you're such an important person, even though we don't really, right? We think it's majorly problematic. And maybe that's what they're saying. Maybe they're just using excommunication as a way to scare him into changing his approach. And they're saying, it's not like they really would excommunicate about something like this, but what they're saying is, right, we'd like to excommunicate you for this, right? Which is a way of threatening and saying, you better change your attitude. Otherwise, you know, we might excommunicate you. So it's interesting, right? Whether they really meant that you deserve to be excommunicated or not is a good question. Right? Or were they just using exaggerated language to maybe get him to change his mind or to see the seriousness of what they were saying and you know, the import of his, of his actions? Right? What could potentially happen? You could be misleading all sorts of people. And they're saying it in a very respectful way. First of all, who was this Todus, you know, is, is worth researching exactly who he was. Notice he was Todus ish Romi, right? He sounds very Roman. He doesn't have the, the name rabbi. So it's also, right? He could have just been a community leader and they want to just have respect for him because maybe he was also connected with the Romans and they were worried what the repercussions would be. Maybe they didn't put him in Nidoy because he was an important person, not necessarily he was a Tamil Chacham or anything. Anyway, it's a lot of interesting ways to look at this story. Okay, moving on now to the next mission. So as I told you, since we had three ways that Rabban Gamliel was lenient against the rabbis, we're now going to have three ways that Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah was lenient against the rabbis. Shloshad varim Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah matir. We have one of these very associative Gemaras, uh, Mishnas here. Okay, this is where, right, in general, it's the Gemara that's very associative with the Mishnah, less so, although you do see a number of cases where the Mishnah is very associative in nature, because also it was memorized, so you understand why they would do it that way. Parato, you might remember this from Masechet Shabbat, his para, Yotza, we'll see later, it wasn't really his para, but parato, or at least the Gemara understands it wasn't his para. Parato Yotza b'ritzua shabain karna. His para, his cow, would go out wearing this decorative ornamental, it seems to be it was ornamental, um, strap between its horns. What's the issue here? So the potential issue is that we have an issue called Shvita. Notice, by the way, we're on Shabbat, not, not um, Yantif, because on Yantif, there's no issue here because you can carry. The issue is carrying. And not only are we pro- forbidden to carry, but it's also your animal needs lishpo, not to work. And not to work would include not to carry. So also animals can't carry burdens, heavy things, or things that are just considered, right? Again, this always, and there's a debate about how to understand this case. Is it ornamental? And if it's ornamental, then it's really not important, in which case it would be considered like he's carrying a burden. This is a little problematic because when it comes to people, if it's a tachshit, we generally say it's permitted. With women, there's a bit of another problem. If you remember, women can't go out with certain jewelry because they might take it off and then they'll end up carrying it because women are known to take off their jewelry to show others. But then that's one of those cases where mutav shu shogi give value mazidin and let them wear their jewelry because that's what they're doing anyway and let's you know, permit it. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. But the main point is generally we say that tachshitim, if it's ornamental, it's actually not a masoi, but maybe one could distinguish between animals and people. And when, with animals, it's not the case. With people, it is the case. Um, there's a different, different approaches about how to understand this ritua. But the point is that the rabbis thought this was carrying and Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah did not think it was carrying. Umikardim etabema biyomtov. You can comb with a fine tooth comb. We're going to see, and the Mishnah is going to give different types of combing. Right now, we're seeing combing an animal with a fine tooth comb to basically take out lice and bugs and other things that are in the animal. You can you can do that on Yom Tov without a problem. Vishochakim et apil pulim berechayim shalahem. You can grind peppers in their millstone. Okay in their grinder. Why can you do this? So there's a big debate about how to understand this. And it's, we'll actually get to this at the very end of the daf when we get to the beginning of the next chapter. We'll talk about in general, what was permitted for Ochal Nefesh. Not everybody thought that everything was permitted for the purposes of Ochal Nefesh. So 
according to Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, one is allowed to grind. It's one of the malachot, you're doing it for food, it's permitted, and therefore you can do it. According to uh, the rabbis, no, this is not permitted as one of ochal nefesh. Again, there's all different reasons as to why, and we'll see this later in the dafo. I'll get to it when we see it inside uh, at the end of this page. But that some people say that if it, right, the issue is you could have grinded it before Yantif, maybe that's why it's not permitted, or maybe it's not permitted because only certain malachot were permitted. Not everything was permitted. Like for example, you can't go into the fields and cut the crops. So likewise, you can't do the grinding. All of it has to be done beforehand. Okay, um, those are, okay, we'll get to some differences and I'll talk about this issue a little further on. So just remember this from here. So he says you can grind them and the rabbis say you can't. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, we're now going to see not only did the rabbis disagree with him about this mikardim at Tabayama Yom Tov, but Rabbi Yehuda also disagreed. There's going to be a three-way machlok at what's permitted, what's not permitted. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, em mikardim at Tabayama Yom Tov, you can't comb it with this fine tooth comb, mipnei shosei chabura. What's the potential issue here? When you comb the animal's hair, what happens? You might pull out hair and it might make a wound in the animal. It'll cause the animal to bleed and that's forbidden. Okay, so that's a problem. Aval mikart safim, but you can do kirtsuf. Okay, the Gemara is going to explain what's the difference. So maybe we'll, I'll already tell you now just so you understand. And Rashi even tells us now. Rashi says it's bimigreret shal eitz. Okay, it's not made of metal. It's made of wood and shishineha gasso. Its teeth are much thicker. So there's much, there's not a likelihood that you're going to pull out hairs, right? It's a much softer kind of comb. You're not going to pull out hairs and therefore not, you're not going to make a chabura. So we have three opinions here. Rabbi Elazar ben Azari says it's all permitted. Rabbi Yehuda said, you can't do kirud, but you can do kirtsuf. You can't do the fine tooth, you can't do the thick tooth and you, the metal versus the wood. The rabbis say you can't do any of them. So we're going to have to understand the Gemara, what exactly the debate is. The first question is an aside, a side question. What, you think he only had one para? It says his para would go out as if he only had one cow. We know there's people who all they own is one cow, but certainly not Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, because we know about him. Neither Rav said it, Rabbi Yudha said in the name of Rav. Every year he would tithe his produce and his uh, animals and take 13,000 young calves as masir, which means he had 10 times that amount every year. For sure, that didn't come from one cow. There's no way. We also know he was wealthy. Remember this famous story of Rabbi Rabban Gabriel when he gets kicked out being the head of the Beit Midrash. And they bring in Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah instead. Why did they bring him in? Because he had Zchudavot and he was wealthy, right? He had all these things going for him. He was wealthy, he clearly didn't have one cow. So why does it say the para as if the one cow of Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah went out this way? So what do they answer? And this also tells us a bit about leaders, right? We had the thing about Todus, which told us a little about leaders and about how their interaction with leaders. Here's another thing about it. Lo shaloi ta, ta, uh, sorry, Tana, they quote a bright that says, so a bright on this Mishnah says, it wasn't his. It was his neighbor's, okay, a female neighbor, Shento. It was hers. Since it was her cow and he didn't stop her, it's called his cow. This is very fascinating because what it means is when you're a leader, you have to be very careful. If you see something and you don't comment on it, it's going to be attributed to you. So since it was his neighbor and he never stopped her from doing it, they associated it as if, first of all, as if he permitted it. We don't even know if he permitted it. The fact that he didn't stop her shows he permitted it. And then they called the para his para, basically became known as him, right? It became associated with him. So you have to be very careful when you're a leader, what sorts of things you do, people will learn from them, right? And, and attribute them to you even when it's not necessarily you who's done them. But right? if it's people who live in your vicinity or people who work for you, right? Or all sorts of things, we all know that things get associated with you. Now we're going to try to understand this through my machlok. At first, the Gemara is going to bring a bride that explains what's the difference between them, which we already knew based on what Rashi told us. We bring a bride that says, which is which? Small teeth, that, right, which means fine, that therefore they can injure. Kirtsuf, they're much bigger and they don't injure. 
Vishalosh machla kopa davar. Now it's the Gemara talking. The Gemara now says there's three different, right? There's a distinction between three people about this. Rabbi Yehuda Saval. Ah, we get to the famous Rabbi Yehuda. Davar she'eno mitkaven asul. Okay, what does he hold? He holds if you make a chabura, but you weren't intending to, right? Your intent is to call me animal. While you're doing it, it might make a chabura. Are you liable for that or not? Famous machlok at Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Meir. Rabbi, Me- Rabbi Shimon says, Davar she'eno mitkaven mutal. You weren't intending to make the animal bleed, so you're not liable. According to Rabbi Yehuda, you are. So he says, therefore, you can't do kirud because you might cause the animal to bleed, and then you'll be liable. But only kirud makes a chabura, but kirtzuf doesn't make a chabura. And Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda didn't see any reason to forbid kirtzuf, because if we permit kirtzuf, maybe you'll come to do kirud. No, he said there are two different types of act, actions. Yes, that's coming and that's coming, but you're not going to confuse them because one, you know, doesn't make a chabura, no problem. The Rabbanan, you can see where the rabbis are going. Why did they forbid also Kirtzuf? Exactly for the reason we just said Rabbi Yehuda didn't think, right? So he's going to hold Nami ke Rabbi Yehuda, de davar she'en omit kaven First of all, they're going to hold like Rabbi Yehuda, that even though you didn't intend to do it, it's still forbidden. And that's why Kirud is a problem. Because Rina, Kirtzuf atu Kirud. And then Kirtzuf, we're going to forbid so that you don't come to do Kirud. Thur al-Azar ben Azariya, savalaka Rabbi Shimon, da'amar, davar she'en omit kaven, mutal. Since he holds like Rabbi Shimon, the Devar Shainam is Kavin is permitted. Therefore, he says, Ben Kirud, Ben Kirtzuf, Share. Therefore, they're all permitted. Okay, so we have this three way machlok. The question is, who do we hold by? So, Amar Rava, Amar Rav Nachman, Amar Shmuel, according to the first version, it was Rava said in the name of Rav Nachman, who said in the name of Shmuel, the Amrela, Amar Rav Nachman, the Chude. Some people say Rav Nachman just said it himself. Halacha ke Rabbi Shimon, we hold like Rabbi Shimon, the Devar Shainam is Kavin is Mutal. Why? Because Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah goes like Rabbi Shimon. Therefore, we hold like Rabbi Shimon. To which Rabbi starts to question. Okay, so either Rabbi passed this down in his name and then questioned it, or Rabbi heard Rabbi Nachman say it and then questioned him. Either which way is questioning Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman. Your whole reason makes no sense. If you're going to say, we pass on like Rabbi Shimon, because Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah holds like him, you should say the opposite. You should say, we pass on like Rabbi Yehuda, because the rabbis hold like him. We always follow the majority. And the majority of people hold like Rabbi Yehuda here. So why don't we say, right, majority, not just because there's Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis, and two out of three opinions, but the opinion of the rabbis is the opinion of the majority. So we should hold that way. So I'm a lay system. Okay, don't get so hung up on the way I said it. And again, this goes back to leaders and teachers and you have to be very careful how you say things and how they get, right? The more, more is less sometimes. So here he said too much, right? He said, because, right? Instead of just saying, I hold the Rabbi Shimon, he said, I hold the Rabbi Shimon because Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah holds like him. To which, right, cause all sorts of problems. What do you mean? Because that makes no sense. It should be the rabbis, Rabbi Yehuda, because the rabbis hold. So he says, Ana ki Rabbi Shimon sfirabi. First of all, this is a broad machlok at Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon. It's not just in this case. I hold in general, like Rabbi Shimon, when it comes to Debra Shannon with Kavin. That's why I hold like him. Ve'od, and I was just adding, right? This is why we say sometimes more is less, because it confused Rafa when he heard it. Ve'od, Shabbat Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah Modelo. What he's trying to say is not only do I hold like Rabbi Shimon, but also Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah held like Rabbi Shimon. So I have who to rely on. And therefore, it was just to support his claim that we hold like Rabbi Shimon in general about Debra Shannon with Kavin. Okay. Now, if Already getting into Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah was a side, a sidetrack. Here we get really sidetracked because in the Mishnah, the previous Mishnah, we mentioned the Rechayim of Pilpilim that you can grind with a millstone for, for you know, a pepper grinder. So, right, these are not like our pepper grinders, right? Our pepper grinders are very different. Here we're talking about something that's more like, not a mortar and pestle, but it's built. The Koran actually has a nice picture of it if you have the Koran. And this is important to understand the next section, which is, the bottom part is the base that holds everything once you grind it. The top part has two pieces that kind of rub against each other, right? You, you twist it around and it, they rub against, cause it to cause the pepper to get crushed. The middle one, okay, so the top one is basically just there to crush. The middle one works as a sieve and all the, the parts that you're not supposed to, that aren't supposed to go through, right, get stuck in there. 
even though it's really, they're both kind of flat, but they get stuck on top there. And the bottom part is a receptacle to hold all the pepper that is grinded. So now we're gonna get off on a tangent and talk about laws of impurity. Okay, some basic laws you need to know about when a clee can become susceptible to impurity. This is good because I know we don't always remember all these things, but we'll keep going over it over and over. It's good review. So Rechaim so Shalpilpilim, so before, before I read, so there's three, there's, there's different laws. One is if you have a, any kind of utensil that has a receptacle, okay, if it's a material that is susceptible to impurity, as soon as it has a receptacle, it's susceptible to impurity because a vessel is something that can be a receptacle. If it's flat, it's not necessarily. Like, for example, wood, flat wood is not susceptible to impurity. But metal that's flat is susceptible to impurity. So it depends on what material it is. Now, these rechaim, there's a debate about them, whether they were fully metal or whether they were wood covered with metal. And that's going to affect how we view a wooden utensil that's covered with metal. Is it treated like metal or is it treated like wood? So there's a bit of a debate about how to understand this. So harechaim shall pilpil. I'll actually show you. I'll put it up for those watching. Show the picture of the Koran. Here's a here's a picture of the of the millstone. So here's the base, right? That that round thing is the base, and then there's two pieces on top, which they show up in the this air there. But those are those same two pieces that sit there, which you can see are kind of flat. Okay. So now, each of the three utensils are susceptible to impurity. Mishum kibel, because one is a receptacle. Mishum klematehe, one is metal, which means we don't care if it's flat, because even though it's flat, it's still going to be metal. And mishum kle kvara. And because one is a sieve, a sieve. And a sieve has a whole thing, the rabbis, even though a sieve is kind of flat, the rabbis, and doesn't really have a receptacle, the rabbis instituted that it's going to be impure just as well. Okay, so now we're going to see Tana, the Gemara is going to explain it a little better. They're going to quote a bright Tana. Tachtona mishum clay kibul. So the bottom one is because the bottom one is a receptacle. Em sa'it mishum clay kvara. That's what I told you. The middle one is the one that kind of right supports all the all the psolet, the bad parts. And elyona mishum clay matefet. And the top one because it's clay matefet. So again, as I mentioned before, this machloga. It's actually a machloga between Rambam and the post other post game whether it's fully metal or it's wood covered with metal. If you say it's fully metal then when if it's wood covered with metal, you might say that that's actually treated like a wooden utensil and it's not. But if you say it's wood covered with metal, then you would say wood covered with metal since the covering is metal, it's treated like a metal utensil and then it would be susceptible to impurity even if it's flat. So there's a big nafkamina between how we explain, how we understand what this was. Was it wood covered with metal or was it fully metal? New Mishnah. Agala, okay, so now we're really off topic. Since we got into the Rechaim, which at least connected to Rebbe Lazar ben Azariah, but now that we got into impurity, we're now going to talk about something else that's to do with impurity and some other laws, which is an Agala Shal Katan, a wagon of a child. Okay, what is this? So again, an interesting debate. Rashi says, Agala Shal Katan, he uses it to play around with. Right, I, we had this as a kid. Uh, my, my kids had this. They used to love it. Right, a little wagon. You go in the wagon, and somebody pushes you around. It's the most fun thing in the world. So maybe that's what we're talking about, according to Rashi. The some disagree with him and say, yes, it's an agalah of kids that they play with. It's a toy, but it can't be a toy that the kids sit in all the time. Because if that were the case, because what we're going to say in a minute, I'll finish the sentence, and then you'll see why. midras. Okay. Tumat Midras is something that a Zav, a Zava, Yolede, Mitzora, they have their Matame in a way that's Tumat Midras. It's for certain people who are Tame, which means that if the item is meant for sitting, leaning on, stepping on, then if someone leans on it, sits on it, et cetera, then it will become impure. So what Rashi is saying is since this is a, even though it's a kid's toy, since the kids often sit in it, it's mitame tumat midras. That's what he explains the mission. To which some people say, what are you talking about? If the kids actually sit in it all the time, of course it's tame midras. You don't even need to say that. It's no different than a chair, a bench, anything that people sit on. So it can't possibly be that. So they say, we agree with you that it's 
that the reason why it's midrash is because people sit in it. But the assumption is it's a kid's toy that they rarely sit in. They usually push around. But once in a while, they might sit in it because once in a while they might sit in it. Therefore, it's forbidden. So it would be more like a, you know, a, a toy stroller maybe that the kids don't usually sit in, but maybe would sit in once in a while or something like that. It's not really meant for the kids to sit in. So that's a debate within Rashi. Tosfot has a totally different interpretation. Tosfot says, if you look in Agalash al-Katan in Tosfot, Perish a kantrus, shakatan, the kantrus is Rashi, shakatan yoshev betocha, velona hira. He says, I don't get why he would say this, because pshita, right? That's totally obvious. If the kid sits in this, of course it's midras. Ha'en l'cha klim yucha gadol mizeh. What else would be, of course it's meant for sitting according to Rashi. L'kach nir eli, klisha osin l'ktinim lihit lamed l'haloch. It's a, it's a, it's a toy they use for kids to walk with. I remember having one of these as a kid, you know, those things on wheels and you hold it and it keeps you a little bit more stable while you're learning to walk a baby walker. So basically he says, this is source that they had baby walkers in those days, which is fascinating. So he says, that's what it is. Now, why is that a little different? Because it's not meant for sitting. However, it is meant for leaning on and things that are meant for leaning on also are tummy midras. So that's what he's saying the, the, it is. Okay. So anyway, he explains it. He says, It has three wheels. And he holds it in his hand. Right? And it wheels forward. It sounds just like our baby walkers. Okay, I don't remember if they had three wheels or not, but it sounds really like a baby walker. Okay, so now that's the Agala. Is, so the first thing about it, the Mishnah says, is Tame Midras. Second thing it says about it is Nitele Peshavat. By the way, I want to point out here, everything here in these Mishnayot are all in threes. Okay, so right, the Rechaim had three. This has three. We had the three ways that he was stringent, the three ways he was lenient, the three ways Rabbi Lazar ben Azari was lenient. It's a lot of threes. This is also threes. So number one, it's Tamei Midras. It's Nitelet B'Shabbat. You can carry it on Shabbat. The Gemara is going to tell us why, because it's a utensil, meaning it's not Muktzah, because it can be used. And number three, Eina Nigreret Ela Al Gabe Kelim. You can't roll it on the floor. You can only roll it on utensils, or maybe that means put utensils on the ground and you can roll it on that. Why? This goes back to classic Shabbat case. You can't drag a chair on the floor. Maybe it'll make dig a ditch, right? You might dig while you're doing it, like heels on the ground are tricky, right? You, if you walk with heels on, on soft dirt, right? You'll make holes in the ground. So that's the problem. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, that's obviously, by the way, we'll see this in the Gemara, only if you hold Davar She'en Omet Kavein, a soul. Because if Davar She'en Omet Kavein is mutar, like Rabbi Shimon, then none of these are a problem. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, okay, and this we're going to have a bit of a problem because what we just said was Rabbi Yehuda, and now in comes Rabbi Yehuda here. So we're going to have to figure that out. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, kol kelim you can't drag any utensils on the ground. Chutz min ha'agala. Other than this agala, this agala is not very strong, right? It's a kid's toy. Mipneshi koveshet. It just flattens a little. It doesn't. You can't dig a dig a hole with it. It just kind of flattens things out a little, but it's really not a problem. And therefore, you know, it doesn't make a hole in the ground. It's a very light kind of clee. It's not a problem. So where it's healed, all other utensils are a problem. Any other, uh, a chair, a, a bench, any of those are going to be problematic, but not this kid's whack. So the Gemara starts off and says, Agalash katan amidas. To has some Why? Because you lean on it. This, by the way, seems to support Tosfot's reading more than Rashi, because Rashi says you sit in it. Here he just says you lean on it. Vini telep is Shabbat, as I said before, Mishum di Torah Kliala, because it's called the utensil. Remember, something is mukta if it's not, doesn't have any use at all. This has a use. So this seems to imply Algabe Kelim in Algabe Karkalo. You can't do it on the ground, you can only do it on a utensil. My time, uh, what's the reason? To kavid charitz, right? The obvious only possible problem of doing this on the ground would be it would dig a hole, dig a ditch. And then what's the problem there, by the way? It's a toladav choresh, of plowing. So if so, mane rabbi Yehudahi, damar, davar shein mitkavin asul. This obviously then holds by rabbi Yehuda, who holds. If you do something, right, you're intending one thing, but a non malach is going to happen, even though you're not intending, it would be a problem. To e rabbi shimon, because if it's rabbi shimon, ha'amar davar shein mitkavin muta. If it's Rabbi Shimon, he holds the Varshenim with Kavin is, is permitted. And in case you don't remember where he says it, says it specifically about this case. It should be Ditanya, as it says in a bright time, even though it says Ditanan. 
רבי שמעון אומר, גורר אדם מיטה כיסא וספסל ובבד שלא יתכוון לעשות חריץ. רבי שמעון says you can drag a bed, a, ben, a chair, a bench on the ground, right? As long as you're not intending to make a hole in the ground, it's totally fine. So what's the problem? Ema Seifa, Tanakama then is Rabbi Yehuda. But then right after Tanakama, who appears? Rabbi Yehuda. Right? Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Ein akol nikarim b'shabat chutz min agala, mifnei shi koveshet. Which sounds like mifnei shi koveshet in, aval charitz lo avda. Sounds like because it's koveshet, but it doesn't make a charitz. And Tanakama thought it made a charitz. And they both seem to be Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. So how do we explain this? Trade Tanai, but leave it to Rabbi Yehuda. Oh, there's two Tanaitic Tanaim who each hold like Rabbi Yehuda. The Davashen of Kaven is forbidden. However, one whole, it's a, it's a machloket in the reality of this, this wagon. Is this wagon the kind of thing that could make a hole or not? So it's a reality debate, not a, not a debate in terms of what they hold about Davashen of Kaven. They both hold Davashen of Kaven is forbidden. It's just a matter of what did Rabbi Yehuda himself think about this agala? Would it cause, a, cause one to, would it dig a ditch or would it not? And that's the debate, and therefore we've resolved our issue. And with that, Hadron Alach Yom Tov. Now we're going to start the third chapter. And with this, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ochal Nefesh in general, which is a real basic topic that pervades most of our Masechet. Because again, it's what typifies, you know, or makes Yom Tov unique as opposed to Shabbat. Ein sadim dagim in abeibarim biyom tov. This is very interesting, Halacha. We've learned already that you're allowed to slaughter animals on Yom Tov. So one would think that what's the malacha before slaughtering? Capturing the animal, trapping it. Are you allowed to trap animals on Yantif? So you would think, sure, it has to do with ochal nefesh, right? Anything for ochal nefesh is permitted. Well, maybe not everything. We already know everything is not permitted. For example, what's not permitted? Ktsira, right? You can't go into the, right? Anything attached to the ground is not allowed to be cut on Yantif. So likewise, you can't trap on Yantif. So with... Now we're going to learn ways in which you can trap, ways in which you can't trap. It's going to all depend on what trapping means. If you have a pool full of fish, you can't, you can't trap, you know, go fish some fish from there. Why? Because that's called trapping. Just because they're in a pool doesn't mean that they're easy to catch. And because you can't trap them, they're not usable for you. So they're muksa. They're muksa. That means you can't, Feed them. But if you have, okay, Beberin is, is, we called it a pool before, but it's really an area where they live. So if you have animals living in a closed off area, right, whereas fish in a pool are still very hard to catch, but animals in a closed off area are already kind of trapped there. So it's, they can't run away. So if you have a Chayava of Mina Beberin, you could trap them from within that space, because that's not really called trapping. And you can give them food because they're, they're basically, we're going to talk about later, the Gemara is going to say it's a matter of, are you, um, are you responsible for their food or not, right? The fish can eat on their own, right? They eat each other, but the animals need food to eat and they're reliant on you, so you have to feed them. He says, not all these places are the same. It really depends. And even though he says it, it's not the most clear thing in the world, but this is the rule. If it still needs to be trapped, then it's forbidden. If it doesn't really need to be trapped, then it's permitted. Again, where you draw the line, what needs to be trapped, what doesn't, is still confusing. And it's one of the things the Gemara is going to get into, which is, where do we draw the line on this? How do we know when something is considered trapped already and isn't? And it's going to deal with this for the next few days. Okay, Gefet on today's DAF, which is already up on our site, definitely recommended listening to short or about Ochal Nefesh in general. And what I want to give is some background to the Gefet and, and just in general, which is there's two problems with this Ochal Nefesh Heter. First of all, we've already seen that it's not, right, that according to the Torah, only things for food purposes are permitted. We've already learned that it's not necessarily the case. We also, and, and with that, there's all these disagreements, there's sometimes some other things that are permitted. Like, for example, we saw Machloka Bet Shammai Bet Hillel. Can you war- heat up fire to warm your body? Can you, right, all these things are other things permitted, that even if they're not necessarily Ochel Nefesh. So that's one direction. The direction we're going to go in here is 
even though it's ochal nefesh, is everything permitted? Clearly, we see from this mission, not everything is permitted because you can't do tzeda, you can't do ktsira. So the question is why? So Rashi says that this is because, first Rashi here, that's because if Sharma Erev Yom Tov, you're going to have quality is going to go down. Of course, you could shecht and eat before you enter, but it won't be as fresh. Whereas trapping the animal has no effect on how good it's going to taste the next day. So that's Rashi's interpretation. Tosso goes out against Rashi and says, that can't possibly be. You're taking those that terminology from a sugi that has to do with machshirei ochal nefesh, which things that help prepare for food, but not the food itself. He doesn't like what Rashi says. And he quotes a different commentary who talks about that it's because it's like tzira. Okay, and then it's based on the Yerushalmi and Rabbi El Shimon goes into the whole Yerushalmi there. There's different opinions of the Yerushalmi. Is it, is it just, and then there's different approaches. When we limit, we say not everything is allowed for Ochel Nefesh. There's two options, really. One is to say only we're going to limit it and we're not going to allow Ktsira, okay, like the real hard work in the field, which is then going to be similar to trapping. We're going to compare the two when we talk about grains versus animals. Another approach is to say, and the Yerushalmi is only from Lisha and An is permitted. And this has effect on what we learned earlier today. Tochen then wouldn't be permitted. Like, for example, squeezing lemons is a problem on Shabbat. Also a problem on Yantif, because squeezing lemons comes from dash. And dash, right, it's a toledav dash, and that's in the earlier part, in the threshing. All of those are preparatory. They're not like the food's about to be eaten. Only when the food's about to be eaten, like the dough, and you're already dealing with the food itself. But the raw materials, that stuff, no, none of those are allowed on Yantif. And there's a big debate about this, where we draw the line. What's permitted on Yantif, what's not permitted on Yantif. And this kind of, this is like a really big debate that pervades the whole Masechet. So Rabbi El Shamoni gives like an, you know, an intro to it, but it's a really much broader topic, but it's definitely worth listening to and at least getting some of the basics down pat. And then if you want further research, you can always research it more, which is, you know, and it, and it's very confusing because it was confusing to the commentaries, right? That's why there's all these different opinions, right? Even the Gemara, what exactly? And again, I want to at least clarify what's confusing. Confusing, number one, Ochal nefesh, and does it extend to other things as well? And, right, usually we use the terminology, davar shavel ochal nefesh, like we talked about showering the other day and things like that. Versus, on the other hand, we have what is permitted for the purposes of ochal nefesh. Not necessarily every malacha is going to be permitted, right? Can you write a shopping list, for example, if you need or something, right? You, you can't do that, right? So where do we draw the line and I'm based on what? So that's also something that there's a lot of lack of clarity about, but it's a very big basic issue that, again, different sugyot seem to indicate different things, probably because there were different opinions about this. Okay, with that, we'll finish for today. Mladim, listen, to everyone.